Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this year's Manpower Summit. I want to thank Reverend Amwasari and the leadership of Zoe Temple for inviting me to speak at this year's summit. I've been asked to address you on the subject of fitness and health with the major emphasis on men's health. And so that is where my focus is going to be. Uh, at the end of this talk, uh, my major objectives are that, number one, you'll be able to understand what health is and what it is not. I need you to be able to appreciate the major health challenges you are likely to encounter across the span of your life, and then to know what actions to take to enhance your chances of overcoming these challenges in your life. Lastly, I want you to appreciate the contribution of your spirituality to your health. So these are the major objectives of the talk for this evening. Uh, so I'm going to take you through uh, what health is, and then I'm going to take you through some of the fatal and disabling encounters that you you are likely to face across the span of your life, and then we'll talk about what to do uh, about them, and then we'll give you uh, some time to address, we'll give some time to address some questions, and then we'll round the session off. Uh, so let's start with health. Uh, what what is it? Uh, before the 1940s, um, it health used to be conceptualized as the absence of disease. In other words, if you did not have any disease, you were assumed to be healthy. Then in 1946, the World Health Organization came up with this classic definition, which became worldwide. Everybody began to cite it everywhere, that health was a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. In other words, what WHO added to what people understood to be health in 1946 was that it was a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease. But with time, people began to realize this was an impossible ideal. I mean, what, was this really attainable? Is there ever a time where you can get any individual to be able to say they were in a state of complete physical mental and social well-being. The social well-being alone is a massive challenge. Uh, take the situation in which we are now. Uh, everybody is now having to deal with COVID uh, all across the world. Uh, no society can be considered healthy at this time of our life if we have to stick to that definition. In other words, does the evolution of COVID uh, now make everybody unhealthy? That is not so. So there were, there were, there were problems with that, with that definition. And so people began to explore and to change that definition uh, into a more practical one. So for now, what most health experts uh, consider is that health is not just a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Neither is it merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Uh, we have come to understand that human health actually cannot be separated from the health of the environment. In other words, the human lives in an environment, and unless the environment itself is healthy, the human cannot be assumed to be healthy. So you couldn't separate human health from the health of the environment. Uh, so in that sense, what it means is that one cannot be healthy in an unhealthy society. So you need society as a whole to be healthy before an individual could be considered to be healthy. Um, we have also come to understand that what we consider as health would vary for every individual depending on their circumstances. Um, one person's need for health may be very different for another person. If I give you a classic example, those of us living at sea level don't have challenges with oxygen because the amount of oxygen at sea level is supposed to be the, the optimal. But people who live in the highlands of Ethiopia and Kenya, for example, at that level, the oxygen is thin. The amount of oxygen there that you can breathe is not as high as what you find on sea level. And if you are living on the highlands of Ethiopia or Kenya, your body has to go through certain adaptations to enable you to stay healthy at that level. Uh, it is not a surprise that the marathon is always won by Kenyans or Ethiopians because where they live, the air is thin. When they come down here, they are super healthy, you would say. So what it means is that the needs of every individual varies, and we have to define health in that context. Uh, and so far, for me, this is what I consider to be the best definition of it. That health is the capacity to adapt to your environment in order to accomplish your goals. In other words, 
is the ability the individual has to adapt. You have to be able to adapt to the environmental needs and your own personal needs in order to accomplish your goals. If you are not able to do that, we can't say you are healthy. If you are able to do that, you will be considered healthy. Take the case of Stephen Hawking. I'm sure most of you will know about Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking is this individual. He died not too long ago. He was a mathematician, great guy. But he had severe disabled disabling conditions of his whole body. He couldn't move, he had to move in a wheelchair. But this was a great mathematician whose concepts, people actually think that next to Einstein, he's the next best mathematician that has lived. Um, but the man has severe disabilities, but he was able to adapt and still accomplish virtually everything he wanted to accomplish. You can't say such a man is not healthy. And so that is the point I'm making. The point is that the individual's health is based on his circumstances. So health has to be defined as the capacity to be able to adapt to your environment in order to accomplish your goals. If you are able to do that, regardless of whatever you may consider to be your disabilities, you are healthy. So if you look at it in that fashion, what then does it take to be able to adapt? If you look at it that way, you would notice that you need physical resources, you need mental resources, you need emotional resources, social, financial, and spiritual resources to be able to adapt to the requirements of the environment you, you, you live in. In other words, health does not only require physical resources, it requires all these other resources, mental, emotional, social, financial, and spiritual. You could add a few more others to that, but it gives you the holistic concept of what health is that it encompasses all these components. Um, now, if you look at health that way, then you can you can imagine that there are several elements that may affect it. It may affect it in the physical, in the mental, emotional, spiritual, financial realm. But what I'm going to focus on is the physical. I'll talk a little bit about the spiritual as well. Um, but the physical is what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to focus a lot more on men's health because this is a manpower summit. So there are the encounters you you will you will experience in your life, you can group them into two: the fatal and the disabling. The fatal is the ones that end your life. In other words, if you, for example, got an accident and you died, that was a fatal encounter. If you had some disease process that didn't kill you but disabled you, uh, you are disabled but you are not dead. So, on the one hand, the aspect of life that has been affected is your life expectancy. Your life has been cut short. So, the length of life is what you are looking at. But when you encounter an event that disables you but doesn't kill you, what it affects is your quality of life. So what you are looking at is the two aspects of life, life expectancy and the quality of life. A lot of what I'm going to talk about involves both, but because life expectancy is a lot easier to measure, that is what will come across a lot more of the time. So let's look at the environment and how it affects health. Because from what I've been saying so far, you can imagine that the environment and the individual will interplay to bring out what you call health outcomes. So there's an environmental influence as well as an individual influence. So let's look at the environmental influence. Basically, we are looking at what country you are living in. The individual influence for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on whether it's male or female. And then as we go on, we'll talk about some of the more specific things that relate to the male. What is the influence of the environment on health? As I said, it's a lot easier to measure life expectancy. So we'll look at that. Um, first, you look at the top 10 countries where people live the longest. Where people live. If you rank all the countries in the world, you find there are countries where people live the longest. There are other countries where people live the shortest. The top 10 countries where people live the longest, they live to between 82 and 84 years. Number one on that list is Hong Kong. It used to be Japan, but Hong Kong is now the leader. So Hong Kong is the country now where people live the longest, about 84 years. And then you have countries like Japan and Switzerland and Spain and Singapore following along. So these are the countries where people live the longest. As I said, it's between 82 and 84 years across the span of these 10 countries. And then there are countries where people live the shortest. Unfortunately, most of them are in Africa. So you have countries like Lesotho and Central African Republic, from bottom up, coming from bottom up. It's Lesotho, Central African Republic, Chad, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Swaziland, Somalia, Guinea-Bissau, South Sudan, Cote d'Ivoire. All these are African countries. Now, originally I told you about 
the countries where people live the longest, Hong Kong, Japan, Switzerland, etc., Norway. Um, and then you look at countries where people live the shortest, Lesotho, Central African Republic, etc. In these countries where people live the shortest, the life expectancy there is between 50 and 56 years. Now, the country where people live the longest, the life expectancy there, the top there, is 80 to 84. So there's a difference of nearly 30 years. It gives you an idea of how powerful the environment is. The place where you live, the society in which you live, the health systems that are organized there, it has a massive influence on your health, how long you live, as well as the quality of life that you can expect. So that is the influence of the environment on your health. What about whether it's male or female, the individual? Now, there are top 10 countries, again, where women live longest. Then there are top bottom 10 countries where, rather, let's look at the male. Top 10 countries where male live the longest, top bottom 10 countries where they live the shortest. Again, if you look at it, it follows the same pattern. Same pattern as what I showed. The same countries where people live the longest, the females live longer. Males live not as long. So if you take countries like Hong Kong, Japan, the women are living up to about 88 years. The men do about 80 years. So in the countries where people live the longest, women live about six years longer than men. So in the country where people live the longest, women live six years longer than men. If you come even to the countries where people live the shortest, women still outlive men by about four years. And these are the same countries I talked about, Lesotho, Swaziland, Chad, South Sudan, Nigeria is in there. So all across the world, you find that there is an advantage in terms of survival when you look at male and female. So the female has a survival advantage, or rather we we'll say the male has a survival disadvantage. Now this is at the level of the individual. We are looking at the individual contributions to health. So just even your sex makes a difference in the outcomes of your life as far as health is concerned. So that is how important it is. And this male disadvantage in survival goes all across the span of life. Goes across the span of life. Some of you are probably wondering, yes, you've talked about Japan, Sudan, and all this. What about Ghana? What, how, how long do people live? On, on average, males in Ghana live to about 63 years now. Uh, females live 65 years on average in Ghana. So the difference between male and female in Ghana is still there. It's not as large as some of the other countries, but it's still there. Women live on average 65, men live 63. If you take it to Nigeria, it's 55 against 53. So women on average live 55 years in Nigeria, 53 years for men. The difference is still there. So as I said, this male disadvantage in survival goes across the span of life. It goes throughout. In other words, it's from childhood through adulthood to late stage of your life. Uh, if you take even people who have lived up to 100 years and older, you would find that 9 out of 10 of, 10 of them are female. Only 1 out of 10 is male. So that male disadvantage is there. It is there. Men need to be aware of it and, and, and explore what they can do to deal with it. But what is the span of life? What am, I, what am I talking about when I say the span of life? If you take the average person and say we expect him to live to be 80 years old, and you divide that into four, you get a fair idea of what the span of life is, the various phases of your life. So it's 20 years in each phase. So the first 20 years would be childhood. Then the second 20 years would be your young adulthood. The third one would be what is called middle-aged. And then the last one would be elderly. Okay, so the first 20 years, we say you are a child, you are in childhood. Then between 20 and 40, young adults. Uh, 40 to 60 is middle-aged. And above 60, you are elderly. So these are the various phases of your life. You can divide them into four, 20 each. And in each of these phases, there are different health challenges that we encounter. And that is what I want to talk about because that is what helps you to know what to do in the various phases of your life. So let's take childhood. What is the dominant health problem in childhood? What's the dominant health problem in childhood? Uh, in this part of the world, the most important problem, the dominant problem in childhood is infections. Infections. So infections are diseases that are caused by what you would call germs, bacteria, viruses, parasites in the, in the environment. It's the dominant problem there. When you take a young adult, somebody who's between 20 and 40, in this environment in which we live, 
the dominant health problem there are accidents and injuries. Accidents and injuries. Then when you move to middle age, from the time where the person is between 40 and 60, the problem there that begins to emerge is heart disease and stroke. So heart disease and stroke is a major problem there. And then when you reach your elderly stage, beyond 60 years, you are looking at cancers. And in men, the most important one is prostate cancer. Okay, so these are the various phases of life and then the health challenges, the major ones. There's an overlap. In other words, a child may die from an accident or may even get childhood cancer, something that you expect in the elderly. Uh, an elderly person may die from infection. There's quite a bit of overlap. But by and large, the dominant ones tend to prevail. Uh, and we need to be aware of these to be able to know exactly what to do with them. So let's talk about the infections. Why is it that infections are a dominant problem in childhood? especially in this environment. As I said earlier, infections are caused by bacteria, parasites, and viruses. And the reason they are common in childhood is because uh, when you are a child, your immune system, the system in your body that protects you from invasion from all these foreign organisms are in a stage of development. They haven't matured yet. So it is kind of a war going on in your body. So you get pneumonia, you get diarrhea disease, you get tuberculosis, you get malaria, these are the dominant infections there. Your body learns to recognize these organisms and to mount a response so that the next time your body encounters them, it is able to fight them in a better fashion. So that is the reason why these are common in childhood. But you would also notice that these infections tend to be common in environments where personal hygiene and environmental sanitation are deficient. So if you live in, an, in, an, in a society where personal hygiene and environmental sanitation is poor, you are likely to have problems with infections. And it may extend beyond childhood and go into adulthood. And for some time in this country, pneumonia and chest infection was a dominant killer in this country. Uh, we are overcoming it a bit, but it's still there. It tells you the challenge in terms of environmental sanitation, personal hygiene in this environment. Now, <clears throat> these diseases, they ought not to kill you because they can be readily recognized, they can be prevented, they can be readily, they can be readily treated. Uh, but again, our health systems are not in optimal fashion and so we still get a lot of deaths from malaria, we get a lot of deaths from pneumonia, we get a lot of deaths from diarrheal diseases. Uh, you go to other countries, these things are not there. And so you would find that because of this, the likelihood that you survive childhood in this environment may not be as good as you would find in another environment where they don't have these problems. Uh, so that is the problem with infections. They ought not to kill. Uh, but if you live in a society where things are deficient, that is what happens. And so it compromises survival of the child because you, are, you may not be able to come out of childhood. Let's look at the young adults, somebody between 20 and 40. What is the dominant problem there in this environment, in this country, the dominant problem for that age group is road accidents, road accidents, road traffic accidents. Let me give you some, some statistics on that to help you understand it. Consistently in the last 10 to 20 years, uh, if you look at the data from the National Road Safety Commission, um, there are more than 10,000 vehicles that are involved in accidents every year in this country, more than 10,000. More than 10,000 people are injured every year in this country. And as I said, it is consistent. You see it year after year after year. On average, six people will die every day, on average. And that amounts to over 3,000 deaths every year from accidents alone. And over 60, in, in, in all these accidents, over speeding is a factor in about 60% of them. In other words, if people were to cut down their speed, 60% of these things will not occur. Okay just reducing your speed alone. It tells you how important speed is. But that is also the one thing people have a great problem with. When you put a speed limit there, people just disregard it. But how, how important is the speed limit? Why do we have speed limits there? Now, studies that have been done show if a car hits an individual when the car is traveling at 80 kilometers per hour or more, there is virtually no chance of survival. If you are hit at 80 kilometers and above, you don't survive, you are, you are dead. Now, if the person who was driving at 80 were to reduce their speed to 30 and drive and hit somebody, only 5 out of 100 people will die if they are hit at a, by a car moving at 30 kilometers per hour or less. So that gives you an idea of how important speed is. And it also tells you 
why it is so significant that if you are driving in an area where people live in a built-up area you must reduce your speed you never know who is going to cross the road from nowhere and you are going to hit them if you are going at 80 kilometers per hour that person doesn't stand a chance but if you reduce your speed there is a chance of survival for that person it is the reason why when you are driving through neighborhoods you find the speed limit there is 30. it is not for nothing there is a reason why it is there and we need to pay attention to it and as i go on you will understand why it is even more important for the pedestrian now on which roads are these accidents occurring again the data has been consistent the road that goes along the coast right from second takrade all the way to aflau and that road that highway accidents a lot of accidents occur there the road that extends from accra through kumasi going all the way up north to bogatanga that's another road so in this country you can look at it as, as a t an inverted t on the coast up to the north these are the highways that connect the major cities and it is these that on these roads that accidents occur the most now if you look at these accidents in terms of the road user it gives you a very enlightening view of what is actually happening um, because most people tend to think that the majority of deaths occur in people who are sitting in the car but that is not what the data shows the data shows very clearly that the majority of deaths occur in pedestrians people who never sat in the car these are people who are just crossing the road walking by the roadside or having some activity that is related to the road pedestrians they were never in the car 40 percent of the deaths occur in pedestrians and it has been consistent it has been consistent now in the last 10 years another group has taken second place uh, it used to be the trotter drivers after pedestrians the trotter cars people were sitting in the trotter but now another group has come that group are the motorcyclists people sitting on motorbikes 20 percent of the deaths are in motorcyclists people riding on motorbikes so from pedestrians 40 percent 20 percent motorcyclists and then minibus and then the people who are driving their cars and then high boost vehicles uh, bicycles and the others follow so so this is the significance of it the pedestrian the person walking by the road the person crossing the road the person who's having some activity to the road he is not in the car 40 percent of the deaths occur in that group so it tells you how important those people are when you are driving you have to pay attention to the pedestrian you have to pay attention also to the motorcyclist because 20 percent of road accident deaths occur in the motorcyclist so basically what what the data is saying is that you should be afraid more of the pedestrian than the other driver you are more likely to kill a pedestrian than to have a crash and die from it so that is the significance of that data um if you look again at the people who are dying 70 percent of them are males seven out of ten are males they are men and it has been estimated that road accident is the number one killer of men between the ages of 15 and 45 in this country the number one killer of men between that young people economically productive they are the ones who are dying from accidents 70 percent of them are male accidents peak between 6 and 8 pm so the time in the evening between 6 and 8 pm that is when accidents occur the most saturday is the most accident prone day and december is the worst month now if you look at that data it tells you something it is it is focused around activity Saturday, 6 to 8 p.m., this is when people have attended funerals, they are coming back to wherever they left from, a little drunk, drivers are not seen properly, they're a little tipsy, you are likely to, to have an accident. December, again, festivities and a lot of activities happening there. So it tells you the times where you must pay attention and the people that you must pay attention to. But road fatalities in Ghana is a very serious problem. It's a very, very serious problem that men need to understand and know what to do about so that is for that age group now if you move to the middle age group between 40 and 60 when you get to that phase of your life the major problem there becomes heart disease and stroke heart disease and stroke now heart disease and stroke has become the number one killer worldwide now it's a very big problem it kills millions of people uh, those of us living in the developing world have got problems with infection and now we've added this to our problem heart disease and stroke and a lot of it is because of certain behaviors that we used to say were for the affluent that we have adopted we have adopted some western lifestyles that are not helpful and so that has become a problem now how does that happen how does somebody get heart attack how does somebody get a stroke now these organs the heart and the brain have got these small blood vessels that supply blood to them 
small blood vessels. Uh, the blood vessels take blood to the various parts of the brain. A heart attack results when one or two of these blood vessels get blocked. Once the vessel gets blocked, the part of the heart or the part of the brain that is supplied by blood dies off. If it's in the heart, it's called a heart attack. If it's in the brain, it's called a stroke. So that is what happens. Uh, if you were to get one of these in Ghana, your chances of dying within the month is between 20 and 40 percent. If you were to get a stroke or a heart attack in Ghana, so this is a serious problem. Um, and in hospital, we can we can actually um, when we suspect somebody has got a heart attack, we do a test and we put what you call a contrast into your heart, and we'll be able to outline um, all your vessels and be able to see whether there's any block there. We can we can do that test. And we can show you as you can see in the video here um, so this is a test what you call the coronary angiogram these worm like things you see here are the blood vessels that supply the heart so this is a normal one you can see that's a nicely outlined blood vessel there supplying the heart you don't see any block there that's another one you can see the nicely outlined blood vessels there they are supplying the heart there's no block there's no problem with this patient it's coronary angiogram as we call it is normal uh, now, this other one shows you another one, another patient. It's a different one from the first one I showed you. And this one actually shows you that there is a problem. As you can see right there, the contrast or the dye is not flowing properly. Just where I showed you, right there, where the pointer is. And it shows you that that area is blocked. And this person, in all likelihood, has had it. This is something we are doing in hospital to try and open it. And after that procedure, you can see that place has opened up nicely. This is what we do in hospital to help people who have got this kind of problem but there are things you must do to prevent this and not have to suffer from that so that is a heart attack now this slide uh, what you are looking at is a blood vessel that has been cut across so if you look at this one this is the whole blood vessel so this whole thing is supposed to be sending blood onto a certain part of the heart but you can see something is filling it from here this thing that is filling it is actually blocking part of it so the only place available for blood to flow is just this part so all that you are seeing is this part blood should have been flowing across the whole cross-sectional area of this but all of that has been blocked by what you call this an atheroma uh, something that has blocked this blood vessel and because of that it is limiting the amount of blood flow that can go onto the heart in this patient and that is what you were seeing in the angiogram so the image i showed you before this is actually what is happening inside the heart, as you saw in that image. What causes these things? What causes a heart attack? What causes a stroke? Uh, many years ago, before the 1940s, uh, doctors didn't really know what caused these things. It took several studies for us to understand um, what causes these things, heart attack and stroke. And what we came to understand was that a heart attack or a stroke, or what you call heart disease, is not caused by one single thing but rather there's an interplay of several risk factors that determines whether somebody gets a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, we realize that the more of these risk factors that you have, the more likely you are to get a heart attack or a stroke. The other thing that came out from the studies were, uh, was that there were some of the risk factors that you couldn't do anything about. We called them non-modifiable. They were non You couldn't modify them. You couldn't change them. There were other risk factors that you could modify, you could change them, and we call them modifiable risk factors. So basically, there are two groups of risk factors, the modifiable and the non-modifiable. Um, so let me quickly take you through what the non-modifiable risk factors are, because those are the ones you can't do anything about. So first is age. If you are a male and you reach age 45, that by itself is a risk factor. Heart attacks and strokes tend to be common in people who are over 45 years old. Uh, interestingly, for females, that risk starts at 55. So that is the first. The first is your age. Now, the next one from what I just said is your sex. If you are a male, you are at a greater risk of getting these uh, these problems. And then the third one is your family history. If somebody in your family, a first degree relative, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister has got this kind of problem, this heart disease, you are more likely to get it. So we say family history of heart disease. So these are the three non-modifiable risk factors. There are others, but these are the major ones. So these are the non-modifiable risk factors. But what about the modifiable risk factors? The modifiable risk factors, you can group them also into two. There's, there's a group that is behavioral. In other words, it is based on your behavior, your habits. 
then there's a group that is biological. The biological one is a result often of the behavioral factors. One is eating unhealthy diets. Everybody knows about fast foods, fatty foods, foods that have been highly processed. These are unhealthy. The more of these things you eat, the more likely you are to get a problem with your heart. So eating unhealthy diets is a risk factor, but it is a modifiable one. The next one is what you call sedentariness. Sedentariness means that you are sedentary. You don't have much physical activity in your life. You get up in the morning, have some breakfast, go down there, sit in your car, drive to work, sit behind your desk for 12 hours, get back up, sit in your car, drive back home, have some food, eat, watch television, go to bed, get up the following morning, repeat the same thing, do that over and over and over and over again. That is sedentary. You are not, you are not doing much physical activity and that is a risk. It is a risk for getting heart disease. So sedentariness is a problem, lack of physical activity. The next one is substance abuse. Alcohol and smoking are the major ones. Smoking, we've said a lot about smoking in the past. Smoking causes lung cancer, causes heart, because so many things. Uh, really, we shouldn't be smoking. Uh, they put it on their label. Smoking is dangerous to your health. We all know about that. Alcohol is another one. Alcohol is also not a healthy thing for you to indulge in excess. Okay, so substance abuse is another risk factor, but these are modifiable, as I said, it is a modifiable risk factor. Um, the other modifiable risk factors are biological. These are things within your body, it's not habits per se. One first most important is high blood pressure, what you call hypertension. If your blood pressure is high, it is a risk factor. Next is a high blood cholesterol. So your blood cholesterol is high, another risk factor for you. Then there is your blood sugar, high blood sugar, what we call diabetes, it is a risk factor. And then a high body mass index, obesity, overweight. It is a, so you see, the biological ones are all high of something. So high, high blood pressure, high blood cholesterol, high blood sugar, high body mass index. Okay, these are biological. But again, this can be managed. You can manage your blood pressure. You can take medication and bring your blood pressure under control. You can control your blood cholesterol with medication, with diet, with exercise. You can control your blood sugar also with the same things. We can control your weight. You can control it. You can bring your weight down and keep it under control. So all these are modifiable risk factors. And as I said, if you are able to keep these risk factors down, then you reduce your chances of getting a heart attack or a stroke. And that's the key to managing these problems. So what do we do about heart disease and stroke? How do you manage this? The first and most important is to learn to adopt healthy eating habits. The eating is the most important, the eating, the diet, what you eat, what is on your plate, is what is killing you. As the Bible says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. It is not, it is not just metaphorical, it is literal. You can kill yourself, you can basically dig your grave with your teeth by what you eat. The next thing you must do is check your weight. Your weight is very important. Check your weight at least once a week and keep it under control. And then you must exercise regularly. Do at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise at least four to five times a week. What is moderate intensity exercise? Any exercise that you can do and make you sweat and you can keep it up for about 30 minutes. That's moderate intensity. Things like you can jog, you can do brisk walking. There are some house chores that are important in all of that. So moderate intensity exercise. You can do high intensity, that's great. But at least moderate intensity you can do. And then you must know your numbers. There are a lot of people walking around, they don't know their blood pressure. They have never checked their cholesterol. You are 50, 60. You have never checked it. It's important that you know what is your blood pressure, what's your blood cholesterol, what's your blood sugar. You need to know these things and take action if they are not in the correct range. Talk to your doctor, they will organize and help you to do that. So these are the ways in which we can control heart disease and stroke. Now, when you get to the elderly, 60 and above, then cancers become a problem. As I said earlier, you can get these in your younger ages, but the older age is when it becomes more of a problem. Cancer, as we know, is not just one disease. It is several diseases. But the basic thing with the cancer is that a part of the body has a growth that is out of control. Your body generally keeps the growth of every organ under control. Every organ is under control. However, there are times where you may get a growth in a part of your body. In men, the most important at this stage of their lives is the prostate gland. The prostate gland is an organ that sits at the neck of your bladder. The bladder is where your urine collects then you feel like you must empty your bladder. The prostate is very closely related to that. And when a growth develops in it and goes out of control, we call it prostate cancer. The danger with cancers is that because their growth is out of control, they can invade other parts of the body and spread, and that's how they kill. 
it is by innovation and by spreading. Uh, cancers, as we said, the prostate cancer affects only men. Women don't have a prostate, so you don't get prostate cancer in a woman. In a woman. Prostate cancer affects men, and in, in Ghana, this is one of the most important cancers that men get. How do you know? How do you know that somebody has got prostate cancer? In some patients, they have no symptoms. They, there's no way you can tell, um, except you do a blood test. But in some others, you find that because the prostate is very closely related to your bladder, they have difficulties with passing urine. Uh, so difficulty in passing urine is one sign. If you pass blood in your urine, that's another one. So if you have problems with your urination, it's, it's well, it is advised that you talk to your doctor and get it sorted out. Um, but for people who don't have any symptom uh, and want to check, do you have prostate cancer or not? There's a test in the blood that we use called the PSA. Uh, that same test is also used to determine how severe a cancer is. Uh, so we may test your blood and be able to tell, even for those who don't have symptoms, whether you are likely to have prostate cancer or not. So when you get to the age 50, 60, it is a good practice to have your PSA. That's the test we do. It's called PSA. Um, it is a good practice to have it checked regularly, maybe once a year or once in every six months, once you reach that age. And by that, we are able to know whether you are developing prostate cancer or not. Unlike heart disease, the thing with cancers is that their preventive methods are not very well established. So the key is to monitor whether you are getting symptoms that are related to that or not, and then see your doctor. So the earlier it is picked, the better the chances that you will be able to have it totally sorted out. If you wait and the cancer spreads, the chances of a cure much less. So the thing with the cancer is pick it early and address it quickly. Um, so that goes for the physical components of health. The physical components of health. We've talked about diet, we've talked about exercise, we've talked about the physical challenges that you encounter across the various spans of your life. Uh, we've talked about what you encounter in childhood, what you encounter in your young adulthood, what you encounter in middle age, than what you would encounter as an elderly person. But I'm sure you all know that health and fitness go beyond the physical. We, we all know that. Um, health is not just physical. As I said, there are physical components, emotional, mental, spiritual, financial, and all of that. But now I want to just address briefly spirituality and how it affects your health. Because spirituality affects your capacity to adapt. Remember I said in the beginning that health is defined in terms of the individual's capacity to adapt to his environment, to the needs of his environment. Um, but as I said, what is it about spirituality and health? Is there any research that shows the influence of spirituality on health? Yes, there is. But the problem is how how do we define spirituality? What is it? Generally, um, we we conceive of spirituality as closeness to God. Generally, that is what most people think. Researchers look at it that way. Spirituality is how close somebody is to God. The only problem is that how do you measure that? How do you measure how spiritual somebody is? How do you measure whether this pastor is more spiritual than that pastor or this brother is more spiritual than this sister? How, how do you measure that? That is, that is difficult. It is difficult. The reason is because God, these are subjective things. Um, I can only tell you how close I think I feel to God. There is not much you can do in terms of measuring it. Uh, so alternatively, what researchers do or have done to address this is to look at religiosity. Religiosity is a little easier because religiosity just talks about participation in religious services. So that one is a little easier to, me to, to measure. You can measure how often people go to church, how often people pray, you can do that. So that, that one is religiosity. So what researchers have done to go around this problem is to use that as a measure of spirituality although they are different. Religiosity is different from spirituality, but we are using religiosity as a measure of spirituality because it's a lot easier to do research on that. So uh, this is a study that I looked at. It was done in 1999 uh, in the US. It looked at the death rate in a population of American adults. And this study was done in 1999. So it's an old one, it's an old study. Several other studies have been done in the same line. They've come up with basically similar findings, but um, I want to just bring this to your attention so you can understand how your spirituality contributes to your health. So in this study, the researchers tracked 
more than 21,000 people, actually. There were 21,204 people over a nine-year period to look at who among them is dying. Who among them is dying. And their interest was in religiosity. What they actually wanted to know was spirituality. But as I said, uh, that one is difficult to measure. So you use religiosity to, to address that. So they, they grouped these these people, these 21,000 people, they grouped them into four groups. So they looked at those who never attended church, never attended church. And then they looked at those who attend church less than once a week. So if somebody attended church once in two weeks, while like that, that is attending church service less than once in a week. So that's the second category. The third category were people who attended church once a week. So every week, at least once a week, they'll go to church. That's the third category. And the fourth category were people who attended church more than once a week. So some people go to church twice a week, three times a week. So that was the fourth category. So we've got four categories. People who never attend church, people who attend church less than once a week, people who attend church once a week, people who attend church more than once a week. So we've got these four groups. And they follow them up over a nine-year period to find out who is dying in these groups, what people are dying. Now, over the nine-year period, they found a total of 2,016 people died during the period. But what was more interesting was which group did these people fall into of the deaths? Where were they? Um, so they found generally that more people died in those who never attended church. There were more deaths there, actually a lot more deaths. Uh, the majority of the deaths were in those who never attended church. And then if you looked at the trend, generally, the more services people were attending, the less they were dying. So... In other words, church attendance was inversely related to the rate of dying. That's basically, the more you attend, the less you die. Basically, that's what it meant. <coughs> now, if I were to show you the figures, this, these are the figures. If you looked at both sexes, male and female, those who never attended, if you were to follow them to the end of their lives, now this was mathematical calculation from the deaths they were seeing over the nine-year period. They, they, they did this calculation and realized, if you were to follow these people to the end of their lives, looking at the rate of death in that group, they would have lived 55 years. Those who never attended church, they would have lived 55 years. If you looked, on the other hand, to those who were attending church more than once a week, they would have lived close to 63 years, actually 62.9 years. So if you looked at those who never attended church and those who attended church more than once a week, the difference in survival was close to 8 years difference in survival close to eight years uh, and that, that that was surprising and that it, it was that significant eight years is equivalent to the difference between male survival and female survival basically you know so so that is significant and as I said this is just tracking religiosity church attendance but then the results were even more striking when you considered the races so you looked at those who were white those who were Hispanic those who were black the more striking finding was among the black group, the black Americans. Because in that group, the difference in survival between those who never attended church and those who attended church more than once a week was 14 years. 14. A good 14 years. Uh, so what does this mean? What does this finding mean? Um, those who never attend church, those who attend church, difference of 8 years in survival. If you were black, then the difference was 14 years for blacks. Interesting. So, what the researchers concluded was that there is evidence in terms of research to support a positive influence of spirituality on how long people live. Now, remember I said that what they are actually measuring is not spirituality, it's religiosity. They are measuring religion. They are never measuring how close you are to God. But basically, what they are saying from that research is that people who were spiritual or people who were religious tended to live longer than those who were not and from the study that they did that was to give you an advantage of some seven to seven to eight years so since that study as i remember i told you this was 1999 several others have been done that have similar findings basically the research seems to suggest that people who go to church service who participate in religious activities tend to live longer they tend to live longer than those who do not so that is just to tell you that your spirituality is not in vain and it's not something you should abandon. It actually has beneficial effects that research can prove. And so hold on to your spirituality and don't give up on well-doing. So to summarize, 
Um, basically, what I've told you is that your health and fitness are very closely related to where you live, among the people you live, the social cultural space in which you live, the practices that you adopt. I've mentioned also in this presentation that men have a survival disadvantage of several years, and this happens all over the world, virtually in every country in the world. Men have a survival disadvantage. Depending on where you are, you are looking at anything between five to eight years. It's a survival disadvantage. Um, but we also know the re some of the reasons why men tend to die earlier than women. If you look at the case of road traffic accidents alone in this Ghana, it gives you some idea why men would die earlier than women. Um, and then finally, I have shown you that your spirituality has a positive influence on your health and how long you live. So basically, this is all I have to say. I hope you have been blessed by this presentation. Thank you and God richly bless you. Okay, thank you. So um, the question is, what accounts for the, the difference in survival between men and women? Uh, is it that the men are doing something wrong? So there are, there are several factors that account for that. Um, the the physical bodies of men and women respond differently. Uh, one of the things that we know is biologically the woman's the woman's immune system seems to be stronger than a man. So they tend to fight infections better. Uh, things that require the immune system to fight, the women are able to mount a better immune response than men. Uh, and so if you look through childhood, uh, although at the time of birth, males and females are about equal in numbers. By the time they've gone through childhood, you would find that there are a lot more females than males. And the, basically, the male females have out-survived the males. And one of the reasons is the immune system. Uh, now, some scientists have, have proposed that uh, because the immune system is linked to the sex chromosome X, and women have two of these, and men have only one, uh, it explains why the women have a better immune response than men. Uh, so that is part of the reason. The other part has to do with behavioral. Uh, men tend to do a lot more riskier things. You saw in the data I gave you earlier that uh, if you take Ghana, for example, road accidents are more common in females, in males than in, in females. So 70% of deaths are occurring in males. So that contributes to the attrition of men. Uh, occupationally, you find the same thing. Men tend to do more riskier jobs than females. Lots of miners, for example, are, are, are men. Uh, people who go to wars, people who fight wars, a lot of them are males, and so that contributes to to that. Uh, and so, the the reasons why women have a survival advantage over men is a combination of several things. And as I said, it goes right across. Um, the span of life but men need to be aware of these things and to be able to modify their risk when you move to middle age you find the things that we talked about heart disease stroke they tend to affect more men than women and so men will die a lot more uh, and so all these factors contribute to give the females a survival advantage over males and as i said it's across the countries all the countries in the world and it's across the, the whole span of life Okay, so the issue with, with weight, as, as your question suggests, um, we usually are concerned about your maximum weight. There's a certain limit within where we want your weight to be. There's a minimum and a maximum. The major problem by far now in this world is overweight. Uh, people who are underweight, you don't usually tend to find them, although there are some there. Uh, so we have a means by which we are able to determine your, the upper limit of your weight, so the maximum allowable weight for your health. So the easiest way to do that is to check your height and check your height in meters, not in feet, check your height in meters. So for example, if you check your height and you are 1.7 meters, use that, 1.7 meters. So your height in meters, you multiply that by 25. So you multiply your height by 25. The figure that you get, you multiply that figure by your height again. 
So your height is in that equation twice. Your height times your height times 25. That gives you the upper limit of your of your weight. So let's take somebody who is say 1.7 meters. What is the maximum weight that is healthy for him? So you take 1.7 meters, multiply it by 25. Whatever you get, you multiply it by 1.7 again. And you end up with a figure of 72.3 kilograms. So for that person, 72 is his maximum weight. So if he's checking his weight and he says 75, he knows he is 3 kilos overweight. If he checks his weight and it's 80 kilos, he knows he's 8 kilos overweight. So with that, you are able to tell where the maximum of your weight is. And then you are able to make your targets as you, you try your weight again. Now, what about your, your blood pressure? What is an ideal blood pressure? Uh, we used to think that the older people got, uh, the higher their blood pressure became, and that was normal. But we've come to realize that that is not so. Uh, and so generally now we recommend that for everybody, your blood pressure should be lower than 130 over 90. Now the 130 is the one at the top, 90 is the one at the bottom. Actually, the ideal, if you were to really go for it, would be 80. If you have 80 at the bottom, it is ideal, 80 or below. So 130 over 90 is acceptable, it's acceptable. But the moment you go beyond that, regardless of your age, then your risk starts to increase. So if you aim for 130 over 90, that's fair for your blood pressure. Yes, the road accident issue is, is a big one. Uh, it's a big one because we lose too many people in this country from road accidents. And as I said, uh, it is the statistic has been consistent. Virtually, same thing happens every year. Year in, year out, year in, year out. The numbers don't decrease. The, 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 the road user class that are involved don't decrease. Uh, what are the causes of these? How, as I said, speed but speeding is a factor in 60% of, of, of the cases. So that is an issue over speeding. Uh, there are instances of driver drunkenness. You remember I mentioned that the time where these accidents peak, Saturday, 6 to 8 p.m. It is the time when people are returning from funeral, they are little tipsy, their judgment is impaired, and all of that. So alcohol is contributory. Poor judgment is another one. Especially this happens at night. If you are driving at night, you are just using the oncoming vehicle's lights to judge whether it's safe to overtake the vehicle in front of you or not. Sometimes your judgment is impaired and, and you make the wrong call and you can get into an accident. So driving at night, because that is challenging for, for, for your judgment, becomes a problem. Uh, and sometimes poor health and vision is also contributory. Uh, it is no surprise that the DVLA guides now require that you must check your vision before uh, you sit behind the wheel. That is, that is important. So those are the contributory factors. Uh, regarding what we can do to limit that, I think for everybody who drives, the first and most important thing to appreciate is to limit your speed. Limit your speed. If you are driving in the city, driving in the town, driving in an area that is inhabited, keep to the speed limit. There, there really is no advantage in driving over 80 kilometers per hour when you are in the city. Uh, you, you drive just one minute and you come against a red light and you have to stop. The guy you just pass comes to meet you at the red light. You, you really don't gain anything. But in the time that you are speeding, if somebody makes a mistake and crosses the road, you are in trouble. You know, so the first lesson there is to limit your speed, keep the speed limit. They are not there to slow you down. They are there to save you and the road user. So that is very important. Second thing that I consider most is also very important with the road accident is for the pedestrian. As we see, as I showed you um, in, in, in in the in the in the in the data, forty percent of the deaths are in pedestrians, people who never sat in the car. They were not in the car. So when you are crossing the road, you have to be mindful. You have to be mindful that crossing the road in this country is a dangerous undertaking. You know, I feel particularly for people who are trying to exercise and in doing so they are jogging by the roadside. There is no sidewalk. You are jogging there and you've got these earphones in your ear and you can't hear whether a car is approaching or not, and you are depending on the wisdom and the judgment of the driver to save you, I think it's a very dangerous thing. If you are jogging or walking briskly on the, I don't think you should put the two earphones and blow loud music in your ears because you are not able to take wise decisions. You are living your life in the, in the hands of the driver. So I don't think that's a safe thing to do. 
So you should be careful when you are using the road, especially if you are a pedestrian. Don't assume that the driver has seen you, especially at night. Especially at night. Don't assume the driver has seen you. His light may be shining on you, but you may still be in the dark for him. So don't assume the driver has seen you. Assume that the driver has not seen you and take the necessary precautions. Next thing that I think is important is with children. Do not leave any child unattended by the roadside. It is unsafe. From our road traffic statistics, you know that is the, the, the last thing you should do. Don't leave any child by the roadside. It is not safe. And again, if you are driving, as I said, knowing that pedestrians are the number one people who die, you should be mindful of the pedestrian. People who are crossing the road, be mindful of the motorcyclists because those are the second most important group that die. So these are some of the ways by which I think we can control some of the fatalities. The other aspects actually have to do with the quality of the road and whether it is dual carriage or other, but that one does not lie with the individual, lies outside the individual, so I will not go into that. Yes, that was, that was, that was, yeah, I read, I read that thing, I read that circulation, uh, people were circulating around that uh, the American guidelines are saying that cholesterol is not a problem now, it doesn't cause heart disease, uh, eggs are safe for you, red meat is fine to eat, um, that, that was a very disingenuous uh, circulation because they were actually citing a document that had been released by the dietary, it was it was actually in the dietary guidelines for Americans. It was the 2015 edition. In that in that uh, document, you know, the Americans have this practice of every five years reviewing nutritional and dietary research and then coming out with guidelines. So the 2015 one, they had um, indicated in the guidelines that cholesterol was no longer a nutrient of concern. In other words, what they meant by that was that your blood cholesterol level does not depend so much on what you uh, now, this in the 2010 one, they had said that it depended on what you eat. And then in 2015, they said it doesn't depend on what you eat. What they did not say was that cholesterol causes or does not cause heart attack. They did not say that. People interpreted or rather misinterpreted that to mean that that is what they are saying. And then they started circulating it. But it doesn't mean cholesterol does not, is not linked to heart disease. It is seriously linked to heart disease. And if you disbelieve that, you'll be doing yourself a lot of harm. Uh, even the issue with, with what you eat not directly related to your blood cholesterol is, is debatable because there are some people who, uh, I am one of them, I started eating eggs with careless abandon, they checked my cholesterol and monthly then found out that my cholesterol level had doubled, stopped the eggs and red meat and the cholesterol level came down, so that is debatable but that is what, what they were saying, but it is not to be misunderstood to mean that cholesterol is not linked to heart disease, it is linked to heart disease. If your blood cholesterol is high, you are likely to get heart disease. And don't misinform yourself with that. Yeah, so that's what, what is the link? The, how, how, how basically, I think the, the question you are trying to ask is how does this church attendance, how does it influence how long you live? Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, spirituality is actually what what people are looking for, but because that is difficult to, to access, they use religiosity. Uh, scientists have tried to explain how come that church attendance is linked to long life, you know, and these are some of the um, reasons that they've come up with. That, that there are several reasons that, that may be involved. Uh, one is the fact that better behaviors, better health behaviors are encouraged in church. Uh, I, I don't know of any church where they encourage you to smoke. Uh, I, I haven't seen one. Um, most churches would, would encourage you not to drink, or even if you drink, not to get drunk. So those are some of the behaviors that church encourages, uh, which are beneficial to health. So some of the behaviors that church encourages, forgiveness, societal bonds, those are those are factors that are important. Um, church encourages positive states of mind. The things that you learn in church help you to look 
on the positive side of life. You are more optimistic if you are if you are in church. You get a lot of inspirational messages coming out from church. Um, again, some of the the research has shown that people who attend church have better coping skills when they face adversity. Again, I mean, if you listen to any church service, if you listen to any preaching, these are things that are almost there all the time. Uh, and, and research has shown that these may be some of the ways um, that church attendance. So although the research is using church attendance, what it has not looked at are some of these things that is known to be there. Enhanced social support. People build stronger social ties when they go to church. And it is very important in coping. When somebody is grieved, somebody suffers adversity, the people in church who are there to support it. These are all things that are helpful uh, and prolong your life and improve the quality of your life. So these are some of the reasons why um, religiosity or spirituality is linked to better health outcomes. So I want to thank all of you for tuning into this program and for the time you have spent listening. I want to thank again the leadership of Zoe Temple for putting this together. It is my hope and conviction that you've been blessed by this outreach, by this summit. And may God richly bless you for the time you have invested.